Good evening and welcome to Tessa Tech, the Opera Festival from the Cockpit Theatre via Cockpit Broadcasting. My name is Bill Banks-Jones, I'm Artistic Director of Tessa Tech and programme this festival. I'm very happy to uh, be introducing the trilobite or the fall of Mr Williams. A couple of things I wanted to say before the uh, performance starts. The first of these is just to let you put yourselves in the place of the artist for a little moment and think how in the spring we were all ready to go with a festival in the usual way and then you know what happened and the last six months we've turned ourselves upside down and inside out and gone absolutely bonkers trying to work out what we can do and whether it's two meters or one meter or whether it's happening or not um, and this has been really painful, but also, in a way, amazingly creative. You'll see at once how this show has been affected, um, it's been radically changed, and who knows, maybe it's for the better. What has been really interesting is seeing all the artists considering what they really care about in their shows and hanging on to that. So I just wanted to plant that seed in your head as you watch this now. The second thing to say is that we have been working with the Paul Hamlin Foundation to make a hefty report on all this, on the reopening of theatre, just as we did with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, with our pilot performance, so that we can share our experiences of reopening to live audiences. And we'd really appreciate your feedback on this video. Even though we're not live, we are showing you the capture of a live performance we did two days ago here at the cockpit. You will receive a questionnaire after this performance and it would be really kind if you filled it in for us and help us get theatre going again. Um, third, and I think penultimate thing to say, is that the way this broadcast is interactive is once the performance finishes, we'll invite the panel of creators and performers of the show to join us in a Zoom call and uh, you can ask any questions you like or make any comments you like in the chat. They get magically relayed to me on a screen in front of me and I can pass them on to whoever you like. Fourth and final thing to say before we go is that like everybody, uh, our artists really need help if you want to see this show and the work of Son Opera go further. A link in the chat will appear now which says easydonate.org slash fall, F-A-L-L, and if you click on that, you can shower the artists with money. We kept the ticket price for this deliberately low so that you can show your appreciation in that way. Anyway, without further ado, let us sit back and enjoy the trilobite or the fall of Mr. Williams.
Seven seconds. Thank you. 
this one of the seven four. So what's the point of this trip though? So I really need to
Hi, Glyn. This is Guy. Guy, this is Glyn. Guy? Glyn? Uh, Glyn. Guy's the new PE teacher. I've just been for a 10k run. He's very dedicated to his subject. I think Elvin and I, and possibly nobody else in here, will be feeling a great sense of culmination there now, uh, because we know Elvin was one of six composers that Tete Tete commissioned in our very first new commissions that we produced in 1999, Shorts, where he wrote the very beautiful Night Jar. And not only that, after a number of shows in our festival, over the last three years, Elvin's produced a trilogy of shows, Vic and Albert in 2018, um, her face was full of flowers in 2019 and just now the trial of bite or the fall of Mr Williams in a moment I'm sure we'll find a bit more about what connects those but first can I ask the panel back into the room I see Elvin already um, first thing to do is oh. let's tell everybody what will happen if they click on easydonate.fall and send some cash 
Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you for watching, everybody. Um, these past few months have been very hard for the arts and for artists. Um, so if you can donate, please do. Um, we'll use this money to support the creation of more work like the piece you just enjoyed. Um, and whether or not you can help financially, uh, please tell your friends about us and about the great, the wonderful tete a -tete Festival. Um, and they can catch up with this broadcast for 28 days, so it's still available. Um, it's not too late to catch it if you haven't caught it yet. So tell your friends. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's quite right. You can buy lots of tickets and um, <laughs> yeah. And if you fancy it, watch it every day till the end of the month and beyond. So Elvin, I think a really interesting question first maybe is, would you like to tell us a little bit about your trilogy? OK, um, yeah. Um... It's, it's sort of, I, I sort of think of it as a triptych in that they're three different separate things rather than a succession of, of stories. Um, but, but certainly, definitely, the, it's, it's the kind of the magic of the number three, isn't it? Um, they're all um, pieces that I've written um, as part of my PhD at Goldsmiths uh, under the supervision of Jeremy Peyton Jones. Um, and this is the final one. Um, and it's about integrating sound d design into opera composition. Um, this one took on a new um, twist with COVID because actually most of the work near the end was um, video production rather than sound production. Um, and, and I think it may be quite hard to see, to hear from, um, for, from, from the broadcast um, without the live instruments really quite how much sound there is in that piece. I mean, the, this this version of it is is to make sure that the story gets across. Um, but that's the main, that that's the thing that hangs them together is um, because I think it was about 2012 when I started to get a bit frustrated with the way I was writing opera um, and finding it was, it was, it was sort of uh, two voices and the piano all too often because of lack of resources. And I thought, well, what can we do what can we do to kind of enhance this? And so the answer to that for me was to investigate sound design um, and do a lot of field recording. A lot of the, um, a lot of the sound that you hear um, on, uh, in the piece um, was actually recorded on Dartmoor and Exmoor. Um, I live near Dartmoor, so it was closer during, to, to do that. But I, I, did go up to, um, I did go up to Great Hangman and record some sound there. So um, in scene six in the, in the court, courtroom sequence when um, Peter and Anna being very stern um, and uh, about to condemn him to death. Um, you may have heard footprints and sort of rustling of, of the anorak that um, Peter's, uh, sorry, so that Lars is wearing, that Mr. Williams is wearing, in fact. Um, and all that sort of, um, that was that was me walking up to Great Hangman. So a lot of it, that I mean, that's the really weird thing about it, to be honest, is that I've actually literally or I don't know which way around it is. Either I've trodden in the footsteps of Glenn Williams or he's trodden in mine or we've trodden in each other's. It's very, very strange to um, get back home and um, use these recordings as the basis then for, for composition when you know it was you doing them, but suddenly it's somebody else doing it. Well, luckily you didn't fall off. <laughs> I no, I, actually, I had a moment. I had a moment. It was really weird. No. At the top of... At the top of Great Hangman, when I looked down and I thought, "Wonder what would it be like? What would?" It? And then, of course, I pulled back from that. Luckily, but um, <laughs> I only had that feeling. For, oh, oh do you, you only get you only get you. I, I, the, I'll tell you what. Cliff tops do strange things to you. you, you um, that there's, there's um, yeah, they're powerful places. Um, Oh yeah. Well, we yeah. both live in the southwest. I spend yeah. a fair amount of time, my no, time, on yeah, cliff right. tops as well. Yeah. Um, next question, Elvin. Before yeah. we, before we bring the others in, which yeah. I think would be really interesting, is yeah. um, the the story of what happened. What what was this piece going to be in March, and how did it turn into what it eventually became? What was the performance going to be like before? Okay. The obvious so, happened. The plan, the plan was to have three wonderful live singers. Um, the three singers that you've seen just now, but they were going to be live, all of them. Um, 
video projection wasn't wasn't even in there. It wasn't a twinkle in Mr. Jones's eye. It wasn't there at all. Um, there were going to be three live musicians, a, a clarinetist, a pianist and a cellist. And I was going to be just uh, sitting there, pressing a few buttons and doing a bit of conducting. Um, and and so that was going to be the setup. And, and it had to be sort of compressed. So Peter and Anna had to um, consent to being sent into cyberspace. And, um, and so th what happened with that was um, um, Anna and I met up at Ashburton Arts Centre, just down the road from me here. Um, and we filmed Anna singing all the, her parts against the green screen. And then I went to uh, Chiswick, uh, went to West London where Peter, Peter is and filmed him in front of a green screen as well. And they had to um, put on white sheets and blue sheets and masks and wigs and and all that sort of uh, malarkey. Um, and then I had to stick them together, still on green screen, and then put basically instead of the green screen, then different backgrounds. So to find those. So they're all, um, all those backgrounds are sort of uh, creative commons sort of um, images from the internet and include you might have noticed the angels if they moved their wings stayed in the same place and the same with the halos you would yeah. but um, you know I mean there's only so much you can do uh, on this budget um, but uh, yeah so that well, was the people <laughs> <laughs> we need it to was everyone to hear easy donate.org slash the fall if they want more <laughs> but it i mean visually in a way it's in i i the technical execution was limited of course by what you could do and also how we can do stuff oh. here and and the limitations of the project here. Oh. but in some ways it gave you the chance to be in the actual places that pe the people are like no that's true and outside yeah. community centers and things yeah. um it's also an interesting question for our audience elvin i think mm. how what how the sound morphed so both the sound and the accompaniment well the accompaniment even more you've already talked about the sound but how did yeah. you achieve that well i'm afraid that was just um uh, it, that that had to just be the um the sibelius software um stock sounds i didn't have anything better than that to offer um so that's a bit imperfect to be honest um but I'd, I'd compose the whole piece anyway using um a program called ableton which some people might be familiar with um which is fantastic at um at, at changing sounds and processing them and it turns out that you can do that and also hook up the score to it so you can listen to both the score being played back at you with Sibelius sounds and all these uh, process sounds at the same time. It's a, a, a thing called rewire, so that links it all together. So that was that was the way that it was written anyway. That was it was composed using that software. Now uh, those two kinds of software coupled together, and then the plan was to decouple, bring Sibelius, the Sibelius stuff, the score, into the real world with real, real people playing real instruments. But that bit of it. Uh, didn't happen it couldn't happen this time round but well it may it. yet yes it will do i think the plan is the plan is uh, currently that um to uh to look to about probably probably two years time 2022 and do the triptych to, so do all three pieces some uh, as a hopefully to go on tour or or do it do them all together at a festival, some opera festival. If I could just find a, a wonderful um, contemporary opera festival to do it at, I don't know. I can't think of any off the top of my head. But if I could, then I'd maybe take it there. So, um, but also a few other places as well, because it would be great to do something, um, uh, not least down in the southwest and, and in Wales as well, because two of the two of the pieces have a very strong connection with Wales. Even though yes, not it's it. it... I mean, I've seen them all, and maybe some of our audience have. It'd be, it would be really interesting to see them together, because as you say, yeah. they are really different, but have this connection. Anyway, I think it's 
probably time. I'll just remind the audience if you've got your own questions, because I'm hogging them, do type them into the chat and they will appear and be passed on. But um, anyway, let's bring in the singers now. So, Anna, let's start with you. And how was it for you being um, videoed in this weird way and performing like that? Well, I must confess that's the first time I've actually seen it. I couldn't be there on Thursday for the live performance. So it was really so fascinating to watch it just now. Slightly terrifying to see Peter and I in such large forms on the, on the screen. Um, but it was um, a remarkably slick process from, from my end. I'm sure not from Elvin's at all. Tons of editing, I'm sure. But um yeah, it was uh, really interesting actually to to do. I've done all three now, and to do this one in such a different way to have to, even that you know because we were being filmed, I was very static. I was staying in in one place, so um, I almost could have performed it under COVID restrictions. Uh, but to stay really still um, um, and to deliver it, and then also of course we had the opportunity to to do these costume changes which look ridiculously fast, which uh, if we'd been doing it live, uh, we could not have done. So I suppose in that respect, it, it opened up creative possibilities. Um, but at the end of the day, I would much rather have, have been able to do it live and really looking forward to hopefully doing that at some point in the future as well. But it's definitely, definitely been interesting to try it in a completely different way. And I'm sure from Elvin's point of view in particular, to reimagine it. Yes, I can't resist just dropping in a little plug for everybody to go and have a look at My Mother, My Daughter on the Test Tech website where we have Hannah Mason doing 36 costume changes in seven minutes. It's, <laughs> it's, it's amazing what you can do. Um, let's go over to Lars because you were live in the theatre and it um, be really interesting to hear how that was for you performing to a live audience. Have you been indoors with a live audience in the last six months? I have not, no. No, this was, um, it, it's hard to describe how it felt because it was, it was such a wonderful experience to be, to be performing live again with, especially with such a supportive audience like we had on Thursday evening. Um, I, I could just, you, you could feel that people were happy to, to attend a live performance as well, because it's just been so long. Um, and it reminded me of, of why you know why why i do this it's it's because of um of of that feeling of performing live to an audience and being on stage and you know yeah. um kind of diving into a character yes it's a question i keep on asking because i think the answer is constantly fascinating we're now up to we're just about to do show live show number 17 in the festival downstairs in um quarter of an hour and it's very easy for us to forget what a huge moment it is when the first live thing happens. The first one I went to, I was absolutely bowled over by it. It was, it, it was just extraordinary. It, it's quite hard to remember, but for you performers, that's a massive, massive thing, I think, because it's, it's, it's part of what sustains all of us, isn't it? It's... And, and to not have had that for six months, it's quite a brave thing that you you do coming back to it and doing it. But it's great you enjoyed it anyway. Um, Peter, let's go to you because you were also in Timeless Figure. So you've had both experiences. Um, are you able to compare them? Yeah, it was actually quite bizarre going down on Thursday because I managed to catch the live performance with Lars and Elfin. Um, of um, of the trilobites or the fall of Mr. Williams, um, and it was it was just great to watch it. Actually, I really enjoyed it. But it was it was yeah completely different actually, as in both performances. Because even though this one was a pre-record, it was just so well executed, and you can just tell that Elfin is just a, a master at um, sound and editing video software. So it was it was a yeah a pleasure and i think the cockpit have, have managed the theater so well as well it's just so slick um and i think it's a great 
platform for, for new operas and also new um, operas after COVID. I think it's great. It's been really good. Yeah, well, it's... I mean, it, it, the audience at home won't really understand what we experience because we're in a 220-seat theatre and it depends on what groupings the audience arrive in, in what bubbles they are. But um, the absolute maximum we've been able to fit in is 33. So it's radically different. We've taken out loads of rows and you, you don't really see the audience in these videos, but they are there. And as Lars says, they're incredibly important. And... It is, as I said at the beginning, really important, I think, the work that we're doing in order to get the arts back on their feet because you're not going to turn a tap on and immediately get 2,500 people back in the Colosseum. We've got to ease people in, give them confidence to come back, do the research in how we can do socially distanced performances until that can slowly be loosened up. Um, now, there's a question appearing in the chat from Jeremy Payton Jones, who's not only um, Elfin's PhD supervisor, but another Tete -tete alumnus. So, hello, Jeremy. Elvin, can you tell us a bit about your approach to combining the pre recorded sound with the music? Okay. Um, well, for this one, um, I think the general thing. I trust Jeremy to give me a hard, hard general question. That's great. But um, I, I think the way I started with it was actually to visit some of the places. Um, I'd been visiting them anyway, because they're good places to go, at the tops of the cliffs. And, and, um, and actually, because I, I suppose I had an idea about the scenario, and then and I thought, right, OK, so what sounds do we need? What, what is there? What sound is evocative? what is appropriate, what sound uh, is expressive about um, what's needed in this place. So oh, there's yeah. um, sounds. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, you just <laughs> turned into a bit of a cyborg for a moment there when you um, were talking about sound. But I'm very sorry. Yeah. There we go. That's the great <laughs> um, Yeah. I, I, so there's a few key sounds, like the sound of um, chipping away at rock. Um, and there are sounds um, of the environment, like the waves and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they, they sort of form the, the bedrock, if you like, of, of, of the whole sound world of the opera. And then I build on that. Some of, the, some of the sounds get processed. So, for example, the sound of waves are, fitted, um, are used um, resonators to, to, to make to turn the sound of waves into a, um, a pitched sound and attune that and there's an organ sound underneath that. So you get this big swelling and falling sort of D drone under Lars's uh, solo um, when I was young, uh, when he's sitting by the shore. Um, that's one way of doing it. It's just to build it up from, from the soundscape, if you like, of the actual place where he would be. Um, so it's the sounds are the sounds of the narrative, um, and then they become musical sounds through processing, and then they're coupled with the instrumental sounds. So that's a sort of way of creating, in, in a way, a sort of harmony. Um, and that happens later on in the piece as well. But the other thing, the other really important thing is, is, is um, yeah, for, for example, the, the chipping away turns into a sort of broken chord kind of figure around the middle mm. where he starts to see um starts to see melanie the love of his life coming back to him um so that was a sort of long slow uh change from unpitched chipping away sounds to something that sounds much more like a xylophone or a, or um or, or something like that and then that couples with the piano so it made a sort of harmony that way so i'm using um what i'm trying to do is to use the sound both as something that's recognizably part of the narrative, if you like, the sound of waves, the sound of wind, the sound of the school bell is in there as well in scene three. Um, not quite as distinct as it would have been live, um, but that was pitched as well. And that becomes part of the part of the sort of, um, the school bell becomes part of the music as well. Uh, and then later on, um, the rhythm of, there's a, uh, again, it doesn't come through 
uh, well, clearly, if at all, in, in the broadcast, but there's a sound of somebody's, um, somebody's hi-fi, that's an ancient word for it, but somebody's head, headphones, um, you know, leaking out, it goes on the journey, and the windscreen wipers going back and forth, and the sound of the windscreen wipers, and the sound of, so they're coupled together, and that's coupled with the, with the, with the instrumental sound, so there's a rhythmic um, ostinata that's built up then, underneath so um, when he's driving along you hear this doom, 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 all the time that's a composite of instrumental and uh, recorded sounds so so it's very much um bringing those things together so that sometimes um so the, the, there's really there's no real barrier between what's what's sound effect if you like and what's music that the, you, it mm. sort of flows from one to the to another and and it's sort of there's a place where it kind of occupies both spheres at the same time and that's the that's where i'm sort of exploring as part of the phd yeah, that, fascinating we're, yeah. we're beginning nodding running out of time there's a lovely question from nicholas yeah. stanhope to everybody which we should probably use to yeah. also say our goodbyes which is to each of the singers do you have any work live or online coming up <laughs> so i can look out for you but of course peter you've got timeless figure but anything else from you for nicola to come in here or see or watch online well do check out timeless figure um that was another opera i did on tuesday at tete tete and that's online um as well uh, the tete tete and cockpit theatre website um then Coming up, I'm actually, because work is very seldom at the moment, so I'm trying to put on my own work. So I've actually got a concert in Staffordshire tomorrow afternoon, uh, an indoor pilot concert. And then I'm also doing a few things with Hampstead Garden Opera at the, fingers crossed, at the end of October. Um, and then a few of my friends and I were trying to put on a socially distanced kazi, um, which is all very in the making, but it's all going to be socially distanced, and that will be put on in, I think, the 27th of November. So, again, government guideline depending, but uh, we've just we've got to make work for ourselves, haven't we? So, you know, let's do it ourselves. Yes, and we can also delve into the past because you've got, um, you feature pretty largely in our co production we did with the Royal College of Music a couple of years ago, Frankenstein. So, Nicola, if you type Frankenstein into our search bar on the Tete -Tet website, you'll get that. And if you type Elfin Jones, you'll get Anna in the whole triptych. But that's the past. Uh, anything in the future, Anna? Uh, not currently. I've been on maternity leave for the last six months, um, so <laughs> I'm gradually coming back to work, not just because of COVID, but um, very much hoping to uh, get back to singing as much as I can. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still in the process of, sort of working that out. But I think like Peter, um, we'll probably uh, put on some concerts myself. Yeah, well, very good use of the last six months. That's, that's very, very <laughs> sensible to me. I'm and you look amazingly, yeah, you look amazingly fresh faced. Um, <laughs> Lars, and how do you have anything for Nicola to enjoy? Um, there are a few projects in the pipeline. I'm, we're still trying to figure out how how to put them on. But um, the next thing that, well, fingers crossed, will actually happen is sixth uh, of October, Tuesday lunchtime. A concert at St James's Church, Sussex Gardens, uh, close to Paddington. Uh, ho let's hope it doesn't get cancelled. Well, indeed, fingers crossed, because yeah, it's quite a hairy time at the moment. Still, we're here for three more performances at the Cockpit Theatre. Um, I think it's time to say goodbye. The uh, easy donate link will appear magically on your screen now. G goodbye to you four. Thank you very much.